Lana. I'm back alive. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. It's 10 o'clock. Welcome uh, to our program. Uh, a couple of quick items before we get down to business this morning. I want to thank our host, uh, HSBC Bank, who uh, has been a very, very strong partner of ours with a lot of our realtor programs. So I thank uh, Rod Abutos and the, and the good team at HSBC for sporting, supporting us today. We have um, muted uh, everybody's um, audio and um, video, um, but occasionally somebody will come in uh, through the screen um, onto Zoom. If you see yourself on screen and you are not a panelist, uh, please uh, mute yourself because the only people who should be on screen uh, should be the, um, the panelists and myself. Um, we, um, there is a chat button at the bottom. You will see if you have a question that comes up uh, and you want to ask the, uh, the panel, uh, throw that question to the panel, uh, feel free to, uh, to uh, pop it down there and I'll, I'll pick it up and try to incorporate it into our, our conversation. And the inevitable question I get, yes, we are recording today's program. Uh, we will send out a link this afternoon. I know with Real to Some, you get called away mid-program. You will be able to see a full recording uh, when we send out the link. We post to YouTube around about four or five o'clock in the afternoon. So this program, we've called it Taming the Beast. What can realtors expect in 2023? Why do we do that? Very simply, as we end what has been a very erratic year, fraught with highs, lows, unpredictability and instability, we're entering uh, what some might term the dark tunnel of 2023 with either a, a sort of an air of, of optimism or an air of caution, depending upon where you are, whether you're a, a glass half full or a glass half empty. So we've pulled together a panel of, of sort of successful, proven, close to the ground um, realtors who know their territories inside out and back to front. And we've asked them to sort of join us today and, and give us the perspective as to what's happening and what we can expect in 2023. I apologize for the large screen, but I, I felt the Bay Area being so large, we wanted to have representation of the whole Bay Area. So to the panel and to our, uh, and to our uh, audience, I apologize that we've, we've got such a large screen, but we had to do that because I wanted the, the creme de la creme here today. Let me introduce the panel uh, alphabetically. Uh, Michael Bellings, representing the perspective of uh, San Francisco from Compass. Nick Canning, uh, giving us Carmel's uh, point of view. Uh, with Sotheby's International Realty. Dana Green um, of Compass, who uh, knows Lafayette inside out and back to front. Paul mm -hmm. Griffiths with Vista Asset Management, who'll give us the leasing and the rental perspective. Right. Very, very important. Um, DJ Grubb, uh, uh, who knows Oakland uh, inside out and back to front with the Grubb Company. Uh, Jamie Jones and Julie Mariani Cassell, uh, uh, who will give us Menlo Park and Silicon Valley and what's happening down there, there with Intero. Mark McLaughlin, I asked to join us today because Mark knows the brokerage territory and obviously knows the Bay Area as well. So we'll be able to bring in both of his perspectives. Tracy McLaughlin will tell us what's going on in good old Marin. Um, and she's with Engel and Volkers. Uh, Jonathan So, who will give us the wine country perspective uh, mm. from Sotheby's International Realty. And our good friend, Trinky Watson, who can tell us what's going on in the in the sort of the the resort markets? Our good friends uh, in Tahoe, and of course, Trinky uh, is with um, Chase International. To all of our uh, presenters, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Let's, Tracy. I'm going to start with you, and I want to rip around the board very, very quickly, please. In sort of twenty, in the proverbial twenty-five words or less, give me the state of your market. If I was to go click click with the camera today. What would I see in your territory or in your marketplace? Tracy, let's start with you and we'll go around the board. Okay, um, there's a bit of a fissure in my answer. The class A, grade A, brand new construction on a level lot that would take somebody in this market five, six years to build in, is still selling at some record setting prices. I've sold a couple of homes in the last couple of months at, at new benchmarks for pricing on the higher end. The sort of generalized uh, a perspective in Marin County for houses that are not in that category is we feel like we're back to maybe 2019 pre-COVID pricing. We've dropped out that much on a percentage basis, just depending on what sub-market you're talking about. Okay. DJ, Oakland, East Bay. 
Uh, we are literally back to 2019 pricing plus plus. Um, our buyers are negotiating over defects in property. Our buyers are asking for price reductions. Our buyers are um, very, very apprehensive in the process. So we're in a pause effectively to see, we'll get through the holiday season and hopefully we'll get into some kind of rhythm and robust market in the spring. Nick, what about Carmel? Uh, yeah, so uh, the coastline is still very desirable and the work from home reality is uh, here to stay in our area. Uh, buyers are increasingly being price sensitive <laughs> and uh, inventory remains very tight. So uh, prices and median sales prices have been holding firm uh, throughout the fourth quarter. Grinky, Tahoe? <clears throat> uh, discretionary market, uh, since we're mostly <clears throat> resort, uh, buyers are uh, cautious. Sellers are nervous, um, but I think once we get through the holidays, I, I feel that we'll get back into a more, uh, I say normal market, which means back to the 2019 uh, scenario, not what we've seen in the last couple of years. I'll come to you at the end, Paul, if I may. Jonathan, wine country? Sure. Um... Similar to Nick's response, the work from home movement has changed our market forever. Um, uh, the, the real difference here between, you know, here and maybe other markets like Lake Tahoe or Bend, Oregon or other places that people move to, you can still commute to your job one or two days a week from up here if you need to. And so um, Napa and Sonoma have really become Marin County as far as uh, 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 an option for people to live. So it's that's changed the market forever. Um, we still have very low inventory. Um, that's compounded by the fact that we lost oh, at least 6,000, 7,000 homes over the last five years because of the fires. Okay. Dana, your territory, East Bay? Yeah, so in La Mirinda, Lafayette, Moraga, and Dorinda, our market is crickets. We are exercising and calling past clients as realtors because we are 22% off the April high. But what's interesting is we're only 2% lower in price than we were in November of 2021. The other thing that's happening is most of the inventory that's on is not selling. Our absorption rate is about 34% right now. So we're three times the inventory, but it's not inventory that's the desirable inventory. It's the inventory that's got some funk. Okay. Jamie and Julie, Menlo Park, Silicon Valley. Yeah, so for our area, Los Altos to Burlingame, Mid Peninsula, Mid Peninsula, the market is really dependent on the specific house. So somehow there's a lot of cash buyers here. So some houses are selling for even what they would have sold the beginning of the year. But for the most part, I would say we're down about 10 to 13 percent in prices, and our inventory is very, very low. And each price point is a little different. You know where the you know sub two million dollar price range, of course, is very affected by interest rates, but properties are still moving, especially the good ones. Okay. And Michael, San Francisco? Yeah, I would say things are slow but steady. Um, the, the buyer sense of urgency is certainly down. They have more options to choose from than they had in a long time. And, and everything, you know, if there's a little feature about a home that, that back in the day they wouldn't have cared about, now it's being magnified. Um, so kind of like DJ was talking about um, dealing with contingencies, dealing with credits, dealing with, uh, you know, seller rate buy downs, um, which we haven't dealt with in a long time. I'd say condos have taken anywhere from a six to 12 percent, depending on the neighborhood. And even some single family homes have taken um, a price cut, but we don't have a glutton of inventory. So we haven't seen you know, there's definitely less buyer urgency out there and they're they're, you know, have a lot more choices. But the inventory is not out of control that 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 it's affecting our market to a huge extent, I would say. Paul, give us give us the overview on leasing and rental. So while on the sales side, it's been clearly hit by interest rates, we've actually gotten a boom in our inventory. A lot of properties that couldn't sell are pushing onto the lease market, which has been great for us. We grew more in Q4 than we did in Q3. Um, and I think what this has done is created an opportunity for greater partnership with other agents who can't sell properties to pop it on the lease market for a couple of years until the market can pick up again. 
From a tenant side, we're noticing that there's definitely an effect in their consumer confidence, meaning their desire to commit to an overpriced rental or a rental that might be slightly out of their range. They're affected by these layoffs that are happening, which is then in turn affecting their confidence to be able to commit to a 12-month lease um, if they're not confident that they'll have those jobs at the end of the week or at the end of the year. And Mark, your overall perspective from a brokerage point of view? Well, we definitely have a pause in the markets in, in units, if you will. Um, it does feel like 2019, um, and uh, but I think you need to take about 10 to 20% of the volume out of your 2019 to figure out what your 2023 is going to be. Um, obviously, we need more comps. We need velocity of comps to get the direction of the market. Um, so we've seen all this before. We've seen it in 20, 2009. Excuse me. We've seen it in 2009, 2018, and again in March of 2020, and we will eat again. You just have to remember that things will return to normal, whatever normal might be. Most important thing is I think you have to go and meet your sellers and your buyers where they are, and that's not a geographic location. That's a state of mind. Okay. But anybody, just uh, let me throw this to the panel in sort of in in, in broad form. What did we learn from 2022 that sort of sets us up as a precursor for 2023? Anybody? What, what did we learn? What's the lesson that we need to take out of 2022? I, can I speak to that? Please. I just, I just think the most important thing that we can do is communicate. We've got, I mean, that's always been kind of a strong suit of mine. And I just think that um, communicating with our, you know, our sphere not worrying about where the next deal is coming from out of the space, so to speak, but working with the people you know, um, whether it's on a referral basis or whatever. But I just think that constant communication and whatever is comfortable for you, whether it's the phone, constant email, whatever, whatever. But to me, that's the key to our success. Well, yeah. Craig, it's a, it, it's, a, it's a switch in skill sets. The agent that functioned very well in that market may not be able to transition to this market because they didn't communicate or didn't have to communicate, right? right? And today it's a high, it's, more, it's a more high touch, high communication human business. Absolutely. I mean, technology has its place. I'm not discounting that, but this is we've gone back to real estate brokerage as we know real estate brokerage. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm calling. Add, it. Yeah, go ahead. I was just, I'm calling it back to basics, similar to what Trinky's talking about on communication, back to basics. I mean, anyone could have business in the start of 2022, uh, but now you have to be really strategic about it. Go back to doing open houses, go back to door knocking, go back to calling past clients, kind of going back to the fundamentals of lead prospecting in the business, which a lot of people didn't have to do for a couple of years. Right. And, and, you know, none of us have a crystal ball, but I think it's really important to make sure that we're setting client expectations. The market is changing and has changed and will continue to change. That's the nature of real estate, but making sure that clients, buyers and sellers alike have an expectation of what the pricing is and being smarter than they are on a day-to-day -day basis as data changes. Michael. So, Go ahead. So Alf, this, so Alf, this is the biggest issue, I think, in the real estate community. A lot of real estate agents don't believe we've gone into a new market or aren't prepared for the new market, right? So they've really got to gear up and get ready for where we're going here. I think that's a big, big deal. So there's, we went through the shock and awe that the market changed. Okay, the market changed. Now let's go into and gear up for the new market. Let's edu re-educate ourselves and educate our real estate population. That's really key here. And if we don't do that, we'll kind of slide into... I don't know, you know, how to oh, homogenize nothing. We won't go I'll, anywhere. I would share this story with you. Our office uh, re signed, worked on, marketed, got it on MLS, $120 million worth of business this year that ultimately got canceled by the seller. Uh, this is in the high end because they have so much wealth and equity in these homes. They just don't need to sell them. <laughs> And their egos are really bigger than their need to transfer that those proceeds into a bank account. So the lesson I've learned from 2022 is to hold on to those relationships, to let them know that their transaction, it doesn't matter, they're a lifelong client. If they're ready in a year or two years, it's a very hard thing to do, to let business, to break listing agreements that you've worked really hard on and just, you know, you've, you're, you're letting them break a contract and you're trusting that they'll come back to you in a year or two. That is a lot of, um, you know, there's in my office, that's been the most stressful component of this year is actually doing all that work and then never getting paid for it. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. But but you but you feel you'll get that back at some point in the future. Yes, by letting by, by elegantly letting yes. people go and then and then continuing to communicate as their you know uh, representative or somebody who know has a lot of knowledge about the business. Yes. I, yeah, I agree with Tracy. I think it's all about asking questions right now because you can't force a market and you can't force a sale. So we have to determine um, with our clients what's in their best interest and you have to look big picture and it may be in their best interest to buy and it may be in their best interest to sell or it may be in their best interest to hold. So it's helping them determine what their needs are so that we can represent them to the best of our ability. I think on the leasing and the um, the management side, one one thing I've noticed in this market is it's given um, myself and my team an opportunity to start conversations with our clients around assets that maybe were able to be parlayed in a different market. When we had a more thriving market, tenants were able to accept things that were at a market level of acceptance versus now we're starting lots of new conversations with our clients to say, listen, the market's down. We have to be more competitive by doing more strategic renovations on the properties, not only in the insides of units, but also on the common areas as well. So for us, we've seen like a huge boost in just the sheer construction that we're doing during this period of time to really leverage these properties to be their highest and best. So when the market hopefully picks up in the new year, we're able to be more competitive within those markets. Let me let's go into 2023 if we can and sort of get get some feelings about what's going to happen there. Let's start with the economic impact. You've got inflation. What was it? 7.3 today. Still high. We've got the, the, the whole mortgage rate issue. We've got stock market fluctuations. The Dow's up, the Dow's down. Um, and then, of course, all the political impacts coming out of the midterms. Um, what are you hearing from your from your client base in terms of their overall feeling about the economy and how that will affect uh, their real estate activity in 23? Who wants to kick me off? Well, I think the elephant in the room for all of our clients is that they have equity in their houses. So they're not in a position like they were in in 2008. They do not have to sell. They can cash flow their house by renting it. They can carry it. So they're looking at real estate as a choice right now. They have the choice to, to hold it if they want to, to hold it. So they're waiting to see what those economic factors are. And I don't think um, 2023 has revealed itself yet. It's really hard to know what, where we're going to go. So what are you telling them about 2023, Dana, from an economic point of view? Yeah, I think um, I think it's going to be a tough year. And again, it comes back to their individual situations. What do they need? Um, and how does their house play into that factor? Anybody else? It's hard to trade. If you have a three, three and a half percent interest rate currently on your mortgage, it's hard to think about trading that for five or six. So until things settle down um, with interest rates, which all indications will happen. They're, they're artificially inflated right now, but I think it's going to be a bumpy next six months. Um, if we can kind of make it through late spring, early summer, they may settle down in the high fours and that be, will become the new normal, which I think I think part of it is people are just sort of been in shock of how quickly they climbed in such a short amount of time. But um, yeah, it, it will it will normalize. All so, so Jonathan, what are you telling your buyers and your sellers? <laughs> um, it's a, you know, if, if you want, it's, you know, there, there's also, there's the economic impact of it, but there's also what is the lifestyle that you're, you're looking for and you're needing. And, you know, if you're wanting a lot of people reevaluated their lives during the pandemic and they've decided that they want to maybe live outside the urban areas and be able to, you know, have a little bit more elbow room. Um, and uh, there are also a lot of baby boomers who are living in houses that are dysfunctional for them at this point in time. And so I, I guess the one message I, I continue to have is just, you have to go on with your life. I mean, you, you have to make decisions that are, um, sometimes maybe a little painful in the short run, but if they're long-term, the right decision for you and your family, then you just need to do it. Michael, what were you going to say? Uh, I, you know, it's interesting. I have two sets of buyers. I mean, I have those ones that are 
pissed that they missed out on the 3% interest rate and they're kicking themselves. But that was really May, June, July, August for us. But then I had a new crop of buyers that understand where the rates are and they, they weren't shopping at the 3% interest rate. So they don't feel like they missed out. And now they're trying to get in before it goes even higher. And they're they're talking with me and I'm talking with them about, well, look at the look at the price, the acquisition price that you're getting these properties for. Look at your property tax bill. I mean, look at all of these factors and their understanding that they're going to swallow this rate for two or three years and then hopefully refinance to a lower rate. But they've acquired a San Francisco property for 10 or 15 percent less than they could have earlier this year, like literally in February. So I'm trying to spread optimism to my buyers with with those kind of points that I talk to my lenders about. It's really great. I talk to my lenders, like show me a, a profile of this price at a 3% interest rate at a purchase price versus, you know, it's 10% lower with a higher purchase price. And the math actually looks really good. Um, so I'm optimistic about 2023 that a lot of these buyers now see it as an opportunity because they've been hearing about their friends in San Francisco having a dozen offers, getting blown out of the water, 50% over asking. And now they get to afford a property with one offer, no offers, and they get to take their time and get credits and have a contingency. So I'm actually seeing a lot of opportunistic buyers come out of the woodwork right now. And I, I think I'll see that early next year too. I'm hoping. Um, um, yeah. Go ahead. So I can share some, some sort of macro stuff. And most of my clients are CEOs of brokerage companies, but we have three things going on. We've got interest rates with people, people have already talked about. We've got macroeconomics, which is really inflation, which you've all just talked about. But I think something that's also come back is the cyclical nature of your businesses, whereby the holiday season slows down, the, you know, the spring season starts, you know, in April or May. And, you know, schools, people are going to move because of schools this year. If, the, if macroeconomics are bad, you're going to take your kids out of private schools. So the advice that I've been giving to people, as strange as it may be, is get me the tax day. And I think we'll return to a more normalized market. I don't think it's going to be as bad as the headlines say every day. Okay. Let, let me let me go to 2023. I'm going to just throw out the, the headlines. I, I just anybody uh, respond accordingly. Um, let's start. And again, where we are now, entering entering the, the year coming forward. List, listing prices pricing is down uh, year to year. Any comments? Yeah. Maybe. So our er mm -hmm. go ahead, Nick. Yeah, so our area of all of active listings in each of the sub markets between 30 and 50% have uh, done a, a price reduction within the last month. So we're definitely seeing downward pressure on that. And we're seeing buyer sensitivity. But again, we are, we are seeing both existing uh, buyers, the traditional, again, we're a secondary market. So we have retirees, baby boomers coming down to go buy. But we're also seeing a confluence of new buyers coming down to live here full time as well. So even though our buyers went from 20 to 10, we're still you know, competing on razor thin inventory levels. But is it fair to say across the board with all of us here that, that we're seeing, we're seeing price pressures, we're seeing reductions? It's yes. going down uh, more so at the bottom of the market than the top of the market. I think sellers who have the equity in hand, they're simply just holding off or they're going to wait until spring or summer of next year to bring it back to the market. All right. So uh, Alf, Alf, to answer the question, price reductions do work in this market. You meet the market at a certain price and you'll get a buyer. And this goes back to Mark's point. There, there is optimism, there is a buying pool. Um, and you reduce that price, you'll get a buyer in the market in today's market today. And some of that pricing can come down because it was unrealistic in 21. Exactly. And in 22, correct? Right. Exactly. Uh, inventory levels, tight across the market, I'm asking? Very low, very, very low. Am I seeing head nodding across the board? I think I am. Uh, multiple offers, uh, where are we on that? Declining? Uh, yeah, a good house, house will get multiple offers in today's yeah. market. A great house will get multiple offers. Dana? Yeah, agreed. It has to be pretty perfect, though, because once they hear multiple offers, they get nervous because they do not want to compete in this offer or in this market. So multiple offers can hurt you right now. You really agreed. have to have an accurate price. And the moment that you've got a good buyer and a good seller, then it's fair. Oh. Um, you've got to get into contract. You cannot play games. The under $2 million market, uh, we know is affected by, by the fluctuation in interest rates in mortgage rates. Um, what about all cash offers? Are they still coming in? Is the cash still there to buy anybody? It's about 25% in my market. Julie and, and, uh, and, and Jamie, what about your market? 
Yeah, it's about the same depending on the price point, but um, I would say the higher end, there's it's, it's more common to have all cash. Yeah, so probably over 50% is all cash for the, you know, over $5 million market. Michael, what about San Francisco? I'd say about 30%, but you're seeing it a lot in the three to three to six million and then the high end, but but sub three million, you're you're still seeing loans and really creative loans, but a good amount of cash around there. And those people don't care about the interest rates, obviously. And they're clear, they're typically opportunistic people that are smart and like buying at wherever we are in this trough. Gotcha. Tricky yeah. Tahoe, were they buying second third homes? Yeah, yes. Uh still not with the speed that we've seen recently and some are still paying cash some are going for loans but um yeah and, and i don't think it matters too much on the price it, it just depends on what the individual feels like doing what's comfortable for them Tracy, let me let me throw diff different um uh, a different criteria to you if i may the the sort of the luxury market i'm sort of penning it at starting at 10 billion plus what are you seeing with that with that luxury market? Is it slowing down? Is it is it strong? What's happening? Very you know, quiet for us. It's a it's a it's a mixed answer. Um, again, I think if it's something very very special that's very hard to recreate, and and if you value you know whatever your time is valued at, um, I think it's still very tradable. And we have put a lot of stuff over ten million into contract in the last six months, so I feel very thankful for that. Uh, then again, there are some uh, sellers who are really, uh, they're still trying to break records and they're just, they're just not meeting buyers expectations for their asset and those houses are not. So it's really a mixed answer in Marin County on the luxury market. Anybody else on the 10 million plus market? Well, I actually, bec because of this question, I, I pulled some stats cause I was curious. Um, I hadn't checked it in a while. Um, Sonoma County, the, the number of, we don't have that many sales in Sonoma County, over 10 million. Our luxury market is more like 5 million and above. But in Napa County, we do have considerable number of sales in uh, over 10 million. And um, the number of sales over 10 million more than doubled over the last 12 months from the prior 12 months. And I was really, I was surprised by that. Um, and as, as far as the cash question, um, uh, probably in this office, about half of the, the deals in this office are cash, but our average sales price is considerably higher than the rest of the market. So I would say um, generally you're looking at maybe 25, 30% cash. But I was, I was surprised how we, we, there's, act, there's still quite a bit of activity, particularly in the Napa Valley, over 10 million. What, what about anybody else? High end market? Let me go to condo, Michael. What's happening with luxury condo market, particularly Soma? Uh, it's pretty much crickets, I would say, kind of like someone said earlier about their market. Um, but I, I had a call with a guy yesterday, and he's been waiting for this, so he's you know he's jumping in. He's excited about how dead it is. But from an overall perspective, it's there's just too much inventory and not enough differentiation between the units, and no one's going to the offices in San Francisco. I mean, some are, but Really, my outlook for 2023, if we can get people back to the office and we can get Elon to stop firing half the Bay Area from the tech companies, then we'll be in we'll be in better shape. But we really, we really Soma's not Soma without walking and biking to the office. I mean, that's that's the draw of it. So one thing I want to say about the, there, the lease market. The restaurants are all full. I mean, every restaurant in town is absolutely full in San Francisco. It's it's a dichotomy that I can't understand whatsoever. It's really interesting. And, and there was, was there another comment on this? Yeah, I just wanted to say something about the condo market downtown <clears throat> on the lease side, which is um, the it's been dead for a while during COVID, but the lease market is surprisingly starting to pop downtown. And that, I think, speaks to the opportunistic market that's at hand. There's a lot of people that are expecting that they will be required to go back into office and downtown will start to see more movement in Q1. And so I'm personally seeing right now listings that we used to see sit for, you know, up to a month. I'm now seeing my condo listings are only on the market for about a week, a week and a half now, because people are seeing the drop in the value of them and they're taking advantage of that 12 month lease term um, to lock into a much lower rate. Average one bedroom downtown used to be, you know, like in a nicer building used to be, you know, around, 
35 to 45. Now they're seeing them in like the mid threes, low threes. And so people are capturing that and jumping onto it in anticipation of a change in their work environment. So it's, it's benefited us um, in that space for our clients. I think our pain, our pain in the sales market downtown is, is Paul's gain. Basically. Yes, it sure is, Michael. And thank you for all the referrals. Listen, yeah. it's all of you that's helping me for sure, but, especially because we don't you, do sales. You're saying, you're saying that rental market will come back, that lease market will come back. Yeah, definitely. I don't, you know, I'm an optimist in general. Like I tend to be, you know, like that if we drive our pricing to be what the actual market is saying, not an inflated price, be real with our clients around where market pricing's at, and then also be real with them about scrubbing up these properties that maybe were okay to lease, or they're not okay anymore. And so we're investing. We Right now, my brokerage is doing about a quarter of a million in construction every 30 days. We're infusing a huge amount of money in all of our listings because- we don't want to be the last man standing with a property on our hands come, you know, December 25th. So for us right now, we've got a vacancy rate of less than 5%. And that's because I'm honest with my clients. I tell them what it really is going to rent for. And we just cut right to the chase on that. And I think that's the value that we add as brokers and agents right now to our clients is that level of honesty. Okay. Let me, let me just run by migratory patterns by you quickly. Latest Redfin report came out this week. Number one, out, out going out. Outward migration market, number one from the Bay Area, Sacramento. No, th actually, this is nationally. Sacramento, number two, Vegas, three, Miami, four, San Diego, five, Tampa, six, Phoenix, seven, Cape Coral in Florida. That was before Ian, obviously. Eight, uh, uh, Sarasota, Florida, nine, Dallas, and 10, Orlando, Florida. And then we go on from there. And, of course, um, um, that, that's inward migration. That's people coming into the market. Worst, worst market uh, in terms of losing people, San Francisco, uh, 30, 35,800. What are you, just headline form, what are you hearing on migratory patterns, anybody? Hearing well, nothing. We, we, we've, Marin County benefited greatly um, during the pandemic, and I think continues to do so from San Francisco buyers. They used to make up actually a small percentage of, of our market, he was like 8% traditionally or something. It shot way up. And, you know, my attribution to that is the governance of the city more than COVID. The, it's just the spillover from the ongoing crime, homelessness, you know, all the uh, pervasive issues there. So I think that we, we, are, we are very, very thankful of Marin to, to, to be able to transact uh, people coming over from San Francisco that we didn't have access to before. Any other feelings? In it's San Francisco, of, I, I think the... Michael... Uh, in San Francisco, I think the mass migration has kind of ended. I mean, during COVID, every day I would get a call, Austin, uh, you know, Atlanta, you know, whatever it may be, Nashville. And now, yeah, we're getting Marin, East Bay, but that's just like the typical life cycle of you're having kids, you move to Marin. Um, last week, we got a referral from a Marin agent, someone coming into San Francisco, which is a nice uh, a nice change. But I, I am not seeing the mass migration or calls or, or friends moving, clients that I was, height of pandemic, I would say. All right. Presenters and the panelists, let's talk about 2023. How are you preparing for 23? Are you are you cutting costs? Are you uh, adding staff? Are you adding? Uh, are you going team? Are you uh, adding to or reducing marketing costs? What what should we be thinking about now as we're developing a business plan for 23? Um, let, let's start with you, Nick. What what are you doing inside your uh, your team? Yeah, so, um, you know, we had a solid year this year of just around 300 million. And so we are actually in growth mode. We brought on three new team members uh, with a focus of increasing market share in the target markets that we want to hit. These are all unique, talented individuals that are uh, specialized in these sub regions. And we're also expanding our portfolio of services to help differentiate ourselves from the, the balance of the competitors. We're seeing uh, the team influence increase in our area. And so as others, uh, agents who get worried about this you know, possible correction, they're putting their money in their wallet and they're sitting tight. We're doubling down and we're increasing market share. So you're optimistic rather than being conservative. Well, I think as other people receive, this is our opportunity to increase. And so, um, yes, we're going to see a slowdown. Uh, I, what we're seeing in our area, which is insulated, is that uh, it's a slowdown due to lack of inventory, not from lack of demand, because people are still coming down from the Bay Area. If you had an additional dollar to spend right now on your business in preparing for 2023, where would you put that buck? 
it's just a lot of online, uh, you know, whether it's kind of customer resource tools, uh, online SEO search, everyone's going online to do this kind of stuff nowadays. So you really are best worth investing in that realm. Jamie and Julie, what, what, what are you doing to prep for 23? Yeah, so we are just focusing on basics and where our clients come from. So we're really adding services to our clients, but really focusing on our sphere of influence, keeping in touch with everyone. And we're looking to grow in 2023. When you say adding services to your clients, what do you mean by that? What does services mean? So for listings, it's not, you know, things are not selling in the first 10 days. So preparing our clients, helping them out, to get them where we need the property to be because only the very best prepared properties are the ones selling in this market. So we're finding <laughs> needs that our clients have around preparation to make sure those properties are displayed in the best light. So uh, in summary, are you gonna be aggressive going into 23 or Absolutely. are you gonna be? Yeah, I think, you know, I think our message to, to agents out there is to roll up your sleeves and go back to the basics, come to the office every day, call your sphere of influence, make sure you're continuing your marketing plan. Don't hold back on your marketing because that's when, you know, you lose momentum. There's opportunities, there's continuing to be opportunities. So, you know, keep at it and keep with your routine and stick with your business plan. And I mean, we're going to continue to increase our marketing spend as well, especially with the, wow. the, the SEO um, online searches and making sure that we're the the answer that they need and the people that they need when they're looking. Dana, what about you? How are you retooling? Yeah, we um, already have big marketing budgets. So we're staying fairly stable, but we're juggling where we're spending money. So we're trying to put more of a focus on client events, client education, being in front of our clients. Um, we've missed that over the past several years and are really enjoying that opportunity. Will you spend more on marketing in uh, in uh, in twenty um, in twenty three than you spend in twenty two? No, I'm keeping it fairly stable, Alf. Just I'm moving it around, so I'm moving it to different areas. Michael, same question. Retooling. Um, so Aaron and I, every year, we we look at where all of our sales come from and we call it drilling for oil and then see where the oil came from and drill for more. And, and we've found that our business is past client referrals and sphere of influence. So we're going to double down um, like Jamie and Julie on client events, client communication, past client outreach. Um, similar to Nick, we've had a lot of success in the last six months with uh, online uh, Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn ads. I'm surprised at how many people uh, click on one of our ads and email Aaron and I. So we're going to double down on that, but it's just being smart about your dollars. Like if you're a newer agent or, you know, you're in the middle tier agent, um, do open houses. They're free, uh, door knock. It's free call people. It's free. So I think really be smart about your dollars, make sure they're not wasted. Make sure you're not spending so much money on, on brochures or this and that it's like, it's like really focus on, on what's going to make you the most money. And and that you're good at. Don't spend money on things you're not good at. So we only spend money on things that we know we can excel if we do that activity. Mark, what are you advising your brokerages? You know, it was March and April of this year that I was pushing very hard for cost reductions. I think if a brokerage company is looking at that now, they're way late. They're way late. Now is the time, as a couple of people have said, uh, to drive top line growth, to drive market share. The good will become great um, in 2023. And it's a great time to separate yourself from the rest. All of you on the panel are already separated, but I'm talking about the greater, you know, the greater audience. So be more proactive and be more aggressive in 23. Don't don't dial down spending now. It's too late. The markets are going to come back. You just can't constrain the market, the real estate market. People get new jobs. They get married. They have kids. Unfortunately, people get divorced. Unfortunately, people pass away. The, the markets will come back. DJ, what are you advising your uh, your agents? Well, it's interesting. So we're gearing up our agent community um, to uh, go back to my theme here, to get to know the CAR contract inside and out. And two, this conversation about uh, client interaction and client parties and client open houses and more interaction with our community is very, very important coming off this last year. We didn't pay enough attention to that through COVID. And people love coming to our open houses when we throw kind of a semi-cocktail party event it's, it's, I think it's going to be the new theme for 2023, quite frankly. It's that human interaction. goes all the way back to the human interaction. All the way back to, you know, you're knowing the neighbor, knowing the client, 
being part of the community. That's really, really in essence here. And Tracy? Tracy? Yeah, yeah we've, we've tilted our marketing a little bit um, to a lot of um, social media content. You know, we stockpile stuff. We'll shoot for two days with uh, a crew out of LA. And then I stockpile stuff uh, to take me three months out if I don't have a new listing. So I'm constantly in front of people, uh, whether it's design tips or it's, you know, interviewing somebody on something. It's just constant content. And I find, you know, people don't, there's just, everyone seems to have ADD. Nobody is going to sit through anything longer than 14 seconds right now. So we're actually having a lot of fun with it. And it's, um, it's fresh, it's youthful. And so, you know, TikTok, all those things where that, that's where we've been putting our focus lately and with good old fashioned postcard mailings, which we still get a deal out of every time we do a massive postcard mailing, which sounds so old fashioned, but they actually, people save those. So. So what I'm hearing from the, from the presenters is a sort of a, a strategy of benign water torture. Just keep at it. Be in, keep in front of the, in front of that client. Um, well, Alf, wanna... it's what we're, Alf, it's what we're not talking about. We're not talking about more and new technology. We're talking about more and new interaction with our clients. Mm -hmm. That's what's going I on. Also, I, if I can jump in, I also think, you know, agents really have to bring something to the table. It just, you know, using some kind of old byline of, you know, you have to bring value to people. You have to teach them something. You have to provide something that they can't get from other agents. So, so the refinement of that, I think, is just critical for agents coming up in the business, figuring out what they're good at and explaining to people why their experience with that person is going to be different than other people from a value from the value add standpoint. Also like hit, hit your hit your CRM. That that's what I would tell people too. It, it's if any agent ever comes to me and say, what should I be doing right now? I would 99 nine times out of 10, I would say hit your CRM or follow up. Follow up with whoever. Follow up. Follow up I with that. percent agree ditto that. I, I, I tell agents if there's one tool you need to be using, you need to have a CRM. And it 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 can be whatever CRM works best for you. Um, I, I've got a guy on staff here who is now dedicated to sort of being our point person for our CRM to help agents get on it. If, if there's one thing you want to do maybe during the slow months of winter is get that database in order and, and, and don't and, and really look at your digital platform. Um, that is that is the future of that is how that is how people are finding properties for sale. That is how people are finding agents. And I hate to say it, folks, but if you're spending money on newspaper, you're just wasting your money. I think, too, in 2023, we need to be smart. So as agents, we really need to find the right clients. We need to ask questions that lead us um, to answers that help educate us as to what somebody needs because we can go down a rabbit hole um, listing a house that a seller's not really going to sell. Mm -hmm. So who really are the sellers? <clears throat> who are the buyers? How can we help them? But unless we ask questions and listen, we're not really going to be able to figure that out. I think Dana, one thing that supported Dana, like my business is that like I've been able to look at the clients who I was not on the same page with around how we manage and how we invest in the properties and knowing when it's time to, in a sophisticated fashion, cut the cord between clients who you're not sharing the philosophy with is I think one of the most beneficial things to at least my business right now for clients that don't want to invest in their properties. If I'm spending more time on it than they want to spend on it, as far as like investment and time and appreciation of it, we're not on the same page and we don't share the same ethos. And I think being able to identify that quickly has been really good for my business. Um, I released a client last week who we have three buildings with. And on that same day, which was a challenging release, but on that same day, I brought in two clients that were twice as many units as the ones I released. So it's not often you get an immediate <laughs> karmic return like that. But, uh, you know, for me, it was like a lesson in knowing where to invest my time and energy. The other thing that we've done during this period of time is really spend a lot of time on education. That's something that DJ and Tracy both mentioned, which is it's not only educating my clients 
clients, but it's also working with other agents to say, hey, let me talk about what's happening in the property management space, or let me work with your leasing agents to kind of partner together on getting some of these, at least getting some income coming in for the clients to add a value add. So I think there is opportunity to invest back into businesses during this quiet, more quieter time than, than usual to fortify the business in anticipation of 2023. Well, Rhett, Rhett, go ahead, DJ, quickly. Well, there's an expression, it's called meet the market or wait for the market to come to you. And a lot of these sellers are not willing to meet the market. They want to wait for the market to come to them. Okay, so this goes back to the point. Today, we've got to meet with only those sellers who are willing to meet the market and live in today and not wait for some future whatever. It's just a waste of time and a waste of marketing dollars, quite frankly, okay. to be a little crude about it. Folks, we're at the 15 minute mark here, and I've got a couple of areas I must go over. Let us talk quickly about the home buyer and the home seller, if you will, and just sort of the, 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 the psychology and the behavioral trends of, of the buyers. Uh, this whole notion of uh, do they, you know, are they still working from home? Do they want more space? Do they want more outdoors? I saw a trend came up today on Housing Wire's post that said, they're seeing much more now in terms of friends and family buying, this aggregate buying of friends and family coming in as pricing is high. And that goes to this whole notion of fractional ownership with Picasso. But what, what sort of buyer-seller trends are you noticing out there coming at the end of 2022? Anybody, Mark? Can you add anything here? Uh, I'm not close enough to the ground. I wish I could. We still have a lot. Of um, young empty nesters coming into our market. They're very active right now. And they are trying to get closer to their kids and willing to have multiple homes. So that young empty nester is a great buyer. And you said before that it has to be perfect for them to want to buy, correct? Yes, they really, they want turnkey. They don't have the bandwidth or the time or the energy to fix something up. Other comments? All of our buyer sellers are going through a major life change, whether they're having, having a baby or retiring or moving. So those are our active buyers. So we're you know digging in deep to our past clients and sphere of influence and really honing in on those kind of which buyers and sellers are, are kind of coming up to those big life changes and are moving. We do have some, some sellers that are, have totally outgrown their house and they're just like, grabbing their hair and like, I got to get out of here, you know, so that there is some move up um, sellers that have or sellers and buyers that have enough equity in their house for it to make sense. Um, so they're, yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure this is the answer you're looking for, but all my buyers are looking for a deal. Um, <laughs> that's, that's the number one factor on their wish list right and now. And they think they can get it now, correct? Yeah. It, it's, hey, Michael, saw this property. What's the seller's bottom line? Can you find <laughs> out? I mean, literally that's, that's the calls I get. So, you know, and we have to try to, you know, not lowball, get those bottom feeders, you know, to kind of show the value of the property, et cetera. But buyers want deals. That's what I'm seeing in my market. So conversely, is it fair to say that the seller is saying, if I can't get 62 multiple offers, I'm going to sit on it? The seller well, has a seller's going to be, uh, okay. seller's gonna be better off selling the comps rather than reacting to them. If somebody has to sell, they should set the comp instead of reacting to it. Yep. Is, that, is that what they're doing, Mark? No, I, I, I'm not close enough to it. But I mean, you know, back in 2009, back in, the, you know, when we were going through the, the Great Depression, you were right. far better off setting the comp than you were reacting to it. It's like catching a fallen, falling knife. Mm -hmm. The faster you catch it, the less it hurts. Dana? <laughs> I agree completely with Mark. So it's just getting the seller to live in that land of reason. And if they understand, so in our market, so we're back to November 2019 prices or 2021 prices, but we are not at November 2021 interest rates. So there has to be an alignment. There has to be a meeting of the minds, but chasing this market down is horrible for the realtor as well as the client. You're better to get ahead of it, price it very fairly, and move on with your life and be done. Our clients who have done that have not regretted it. And, it and for buyers, for buyers, remember that they will never understand the seller's motivation and expectations until an offer is presented. You can't intuit that I think the sellers want this. You don't know what's going on with the sellers, right? So get your buyers to write. 
Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. Agree. Don't verbally okay. negotiate. Put it on paper. I've had yeah, a conversation exactly. with an agent for five weeks in a row, and she's like, I don't want to insult your seller. And I said, just put it on paper, and then we'll we'll insult them together. Well, you know, we'll have the conversation together, but people are scared to put offers on paper sometimes and in, in the Bay Area, not yeah. like New York, I hear, where people just send the offer no matter what. Get a tone of order. I mean, that, I mean, that, old, that old phrase, I don't want to insult the seller, forget it. Yeah. Write right. your offer. Biggest right. problem, though, is that agents are not picking up the phone and talking to each other. They're submitting low offers and then trying to negotiate by text. You exactly. You cannot negotiate a deal by text. Pick right. up the phone, have conversations, work together, figure out how you as agents can make this deal happen. Um, but don't don't negotiate by text. I see it way too often. Investor money and foreign money coming in. Are you noticing anything? Any any movement in trends? Show of show of heads. No. 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 Okay. Um, let's uh, let, let's get into some operational issues. Mark, let me start with you. Agent commissions. Um, mm -hmm. Are they going to downward pressure in twenty three? I heard the opposite from Housing Wire yesterday that agent commissions will go up, buyer commissions will go up, less property to to transact. Um, more of an opportunity to, to improve the commission structure. Comments? You're referencing the consumer commission rate, right? Not the yes, split yes, between the agent now. Yes, yes. Um, we all thought that in the Great Recession, we would see pressure on our fees, and that actually went the other way. You need the best person, and you're willing to pay for it when you're in a pinch. Um, I think that the bifurcation of, or the divorce of buyer and seller's commissions will be fantastic for our industry. And again, the good will become great. And I, I really hope that that happens and that we could lose somewhere between 400 and 500,000 real estate professionals. I've had less conversations about that with the seller and, and kind of, you know, awkwardness and toughness than I've had in a long time. Frankly, it's it's not really about the commission right now. At least, at least with my clients, it's right. more about how can we get this sold, how can we get the price we want. Let's do this together. I'm not having that conversation. I think during a hot market that was tougher because any guy or gal will come and put a sign out front and sell it for you. So I mm -hmm. think, at least for me, I've had less pressure on that than I'm used to. Trace, yeah, one, what follow on, I'll, I'll, one follow on point: like if we bifurcate the fees, and you can see what the buyer and seller's agents are getting paid. Consumers are very sophisticated, especially in coastal California. When they go into a Mercedes dealership to buy a car, they know that the salesman's getting paid. It's like they're they're not guessing about it. They're very smart about that. Tracy, you and Nick are handling a lot of high-end properties. Just headline on commission on commission performance for, for the two of you, Tracy. Yeah, I, I have to say it doesn't even come up. I mean, I don't negotiate my fees. That's it's, not, it. it's not in my marketing proposal. Um, if it's it's just a we just send the listing agreement over at five percent. Nick, yeah, very similar. Yeah, we're not seeing any uh, downward pressure on commission fees on the Trinky. buy side. Frankie, Tahoe, you know, Okay, so I I, I, I my fees that I charge. Uh, I'm losing you, Tricky. Go ahead, DJ. I think I'm going to be buying a lot of washers and dryers in 2023. I think buyers need to win. And I think it's going to be a major component of the win, whether it be the reduction in price or who's going to pick up the washer dryer or who's going to pay for this. I don't think we're going to be reducing our fee, but I think there's a chip. And I have no problem in throwing in the chip to make the deal in negotiation. Gotcha. I, I want to go around the board. Start with you, Dana. If there was one marketing tool, let's, let's focus it on marketing. If there's one marketing tool that that's that's really is 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 can't be touched it's it's going to be your go-to tool in 23 it will be what website meaning um we will keep it current with videos educating people updating it all the time with market insights so that they literally can go online and see and educate themselves quickly as to where the market is. Michael? Uh, video. Meaning? Uh, social media videos, um, like Tracy or whoever said, you know, 30 second, uh, either fun clips, but also educational clips, but just staying out there so that your sphere and people can see that you're not sitting in a hole and being depressed about the market. You're out there, you're educating, you're excited, you're optimistic. So video. 
Jamie, Julie? I think for us, it's social media and videos, but also it's time intensive, but we get the biggest return off of going door to door and we make it fun. We listen to podcasts as we're doing it, but, you know, by someone, if they don't answer the door by something being left on their front door, that seller is like, wow. I mean, we just get, we get something every time we do every it. Time. You literally knock on the door. That's what we literally do. Work, work, work the street. Jonathan. Video. Meaning? Well, any add to the list of all the things a real estate agent now needs to be expert at. You, you've got to get yourself comfortable on video. You have, you, if it means taking some acting classes or some speech communication classes, <clears throat> but that, that is how people are relating to you. And so the digital platform that we've, you know, we talk about, uh, it, it's not just good enough to have still shots. You've got to engage and you've got to be able to communicate through the camera. Got it. Nick? Yeah, I think to everyone's point, I think entertaining content is uh, is critical. Uh, coming into 2023, you should have an 80-20 of lifestyle to listing uh, ratio for that. Uh, we, our whole staff does acting classes so that you feel professional on camera and confident. Uh, we also do... Uh, uh, strategic coaching so that you know once they do get that client they know how to navigate uh, the various conversations with that but online 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 whether it's 30 seconds or two minutes it's clearly the, the way to go tricky um i guess i'll continue my weekly tahoe update that gets over 60 percent readership uh it's a fun and funky thing that i put together it takes me two or three hours of, uh, of time to do it but I get such a good response. So that's ongoing. And then I have a targeted program for uh, something else I'm gonna do next year, once a month um, in the mail. And um, yeah, and I also do some YouTube videos as well. Paul? Yes, uh, leveraging emotional intelligence for in-person meetings. When I get excited about something and I wanna share that with a client, they get excited about it. So my biggest leverage point is come meet me. Let's talk at the property. Let's grab a coffee. So that's my that's how I get business and that's how I build my networks. DJ? Uh, we're gonna focus more on human interaction. We wanna do open house functions, parties with the neighborhood on every single new listing open house that we have. Um, we just wanna get closer, more intimate, more involved. And Tracy? Yeah, newsletters, you know, being an expert in a newsletter with content that's uh, not only digestible, but um, it's informative. And then, of course, social media, quick, uh, interesting, but but content that is driven towards learning things, not just um, superfluous kind of fun, you know, TikTok dancing around. Yeah. Or Tracy, let me stay with you. Same question to all of our, all of our presenters. What keeps you awake at night, either positively or negatively? What wakes you up at 3 a.m.? Well, my daughter's going into business with me and we're launching an Aspen. I would say it's right now it's worrying about her career. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not particularly worried ab about the next year. I, I expect our volume to be way, way off. I think it's a real opportunity to kind of regroup, to, 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 to tighten the business up and uh, uh, really talking about all the things that we're talking about, you know, going back to clients on a more personal level. So, um, so keeping me up at, wait, at night is Whitney and making sure that she's successful. DJ? Um, I've got 15 new agents at the Grub Company today and uh, to educate them and get them ready for the spring market keeps me up at night. Paul? Uh, strategic growth, partnering with the right individuals, the right investors. They're the ones that are going to help build my business best. And so being able to determine who those people are before I go into partnership with them is critical. Tricky? Nothing. <laughs> Nick? <laughs> yeah, very similar. We're just really excited, you know, to, uh, surrounded by a talented group of individuals and we're in growth mode. Jonathan? Uh, positioning against our, our competition, the competitive landscape that is ever changing. And I do think there will be companies and, and players moving around on the chessboard this year. So it's trying to stay ahead of that. Mark? Jerome Powell. Again? <laughs> Jerome Powell. Fed. The Fed. The Fed. Jamie, Julie? You know, Jamie and I are, are um, a slave to our lists that we make. We make a list every day. And if we don't mark that off, that will keep me up at night. 
I'll go, oh, I didn't do that. Most of the time we hit it, but yes. yeah. Yeah, but there isn't any, like I can't think of one particular thing in real estate that keeps us up. We, we try to over communicate and over prepare our clients for worst case, for every scenario possible. So we're not reactive to, to issues that come up. Dana? I think we are all so busy right now on a back to basics, taking advantage of this extra time that we are working long hours and falling into bed exhausted and sleeping. Yeah. And Michael? Um, keeps you up at night. Probably my listings that don't sell. I mean, I really care and want to get them sold. So strategizing on new ways I can get them sold, but also just the negativity and salacious headlines out there drive Aaron and I crazy. Um, we try to be cheerleaders and educate people on true data and facts and using kind of some compass tools to explain to people what's going on in the market. But I think we all need to be cheerleaders and gatekeepers to home ownership and not not every every day I wake up and on Instagram, it's like the Chronicle or whoever said, like, the sky is falling. I'm like, OK, the sky looks fine. So um, that's what keeps <laughs> me up. <laughs> Michael, stay with you. Very, I'm, I'm at the at the mark. Quickly, yeah. I cut you a check for three million dollars. You have to spend it on residential real estate in the Bay Area on your own behalf. Where would you put it? I'm doing it now. I mean, multi-families in San Francisco, for me, the rental prices are high, like Paul said, and the acquisition price is lower. So multi-units in the city. Dana. Small turnkey downtown. Jamie, Julie. Multi-family. Yeah, multi-family properties for sure. Any particular area? Mid-Peninsula. Uh, Mark, either uh, on the water or with an amazing view. Jonathan. Well, I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't say the wine country, but <laughs> um, uh, urban wine country with a high walk score. Uh, Hillsburg. Yes. Nick. Yeah, I think the multifamily is the way to go. And it's all about location, location, location. So go with what you love. Freaky. I'd, I'd buy in my own area. I, I, I think Tahoe's here to stay. Um, Paul? Paul? Uh, I would definitely invest in multifamily along Divisadero, along Dolores, in Bernal Heights. And for all of you buying rent multifamilies, feel free to let me know about that management. <laughs> but that's Dana. where like we're not we're not getting turns on our tenants in any of those regions. You got a lot of longevity in those tenants in those regions. DJ. Uh, multifamily in the East Bay is a difficult play. I would not do it. I would buy single family in the Berkeley Rockridge community. And Tracy. Uh, anything in the core of Aspen, Colorado. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time and your comments and your insights today. I, I wish we had more time, but so much here I didn't get through. Uh, to our uh, participants uh, on Zoom, we will be sending out a link to the program. Uh, I suspect we had some problems, some people getting entry in today, but everybody will be covered uh, when the recording link goes out. Uh, our meeting is concluded. We wish you, this is our last event of the year. Uh, we wish you all the very best for the holiday season. Much joy, much contentment, much happiness. And presenters, we are adjourned. Thank you so much. Uh, happy holidays. Happy holidays to you all. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, panel. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Thank Thank you. Thank you.